All right, welcome to this tutorial on signal processing for terahertz communication and sensing. I'm Sandeep Rangan at New York University. This tutorial is part of the IEEE SPOC in 2021. I uh, want to thank all the organizers, particularly Luca, for giving me a chance to talk at this tutorial. I know the talk was supposed to be in person in Italy, so I'm very sad that this had to be online, but you'll have to just see it, this now on the video. All right, so what I want to uh, what want you to get out of this uh, tutorial, if you last through the full 90 minutes, is the following. First, I want you to understand what is terahertz uh, frequencies. There's a little bit of a difference in uh, definitions, so I'll try to help you clarify that. But the main uh, bulk of the talk will be about really understanding what are the differences as we move up in frequency, say from microwave frequencies from earlier generation RF systems to newer millimeter wave and then the terahertz. And what are the unique aspects of these of this frequency transition? Now, as we move up in higher frequency, it really changes quite a bit all layers of the communication stack. But for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm just going to emphasize a few key areas. The first part will be in channel propagation and how we model that uh, channel propagation and what are the effects at the system level. The second part is about the devices because these need to change as we'll see quite a bit as we move up in frequencies and we have to understand their limitations and be able to model and try to work, mitigate them from a signal processing perspective. And that's we'll also talk about how to actually do the MIMO signal processing in light of these two changes. Now, this tutorial is really um, oriented, if you like, to researchers in the field. I'm sure many of you are researchers in the, both in the signal processing or in the communications area. So what I'll try to do is show you what is the state of the art research. Some of the papers, in fact, I'm gonna show you are things that have just happened out in the last few um, weeks. And we'll see some of the amazing stuff that needs to be, uh, that has been done, but also some of the areas that no uh, work needs to be done. The focus here is mainly oriented to signal processing, but of course there's research problems across the stack. Now, if you're not a person who's interested in the signal processing part specifically or communications, but maybe you're an applications person that wants to work considering potentially using terahertz for your application, I'm hoping that you will out through this also identify what are the characteristics of terahertz and when it may be useful. It's not uniformly useful. It has very strong limitations that we'll see, but we'll help you identify this. And maybe you might, after looking at this, be able to see other applications that people haven't thought about as well. Okay, I want to also thank a number of people for which this uh, tutorial and all the work in it would not have been possible without. The two uh, most important people are probably both at uh, UC Santa Barbara, are Mark Rodwell and Jim Buckwater, who are really experts in circuits at these frequencies. I'm not a circuit person myself. Mark is the uh, leader of the Com Center program, which is a large program in the United States on terahertz devices, of which I've been trying to contribute a little bit on the system side. Uh, three of my colleagues here at NYU, Elsa, Ted, and uh, Giuseppe. Giuseppe is actually a drone researcher, because some of the applications here are in uh, terms of UAVs. Last year, I had the uh, opportunity to do my sabbatical in Barcelona. That's where that uh, Giovanni and I held. Giovanni is actually going to give another tutorial on UAV, so check that out. Is part of uh, Spock. My students uh, notice William and Hashim and uh, research scientist here at NYU, Marco, and last but not least, Vasily Semkin, who's an amazing researcher at uh, VTT in Finland. Okay, I'd also like to acknowledge the funding, which this work would have been possible uh, at NYU Wireless. We have a number of affiliate companies in the wireless space that have been generously funding this research, as well as the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which funds the Comm Center program and various grants of the National Science Foundation in the United States. All right, with that in mind, let's go on to our topics here. So what I'll try to do to organize this is the first part of just trying to I'll just give you an idea of what exactly we mean by terahertz and at a high level why we might be interested in it. Then I'll go in a little bit deeper dive into channel modeling and propagation and what's unique about the terahertz frequencies. Then I'll spend quite a bit of time here on the devices, how we model them and what's new. A little bit on experimental prototyping in case you want to actually experiment with these yourselves. And then I want to leave some time at the end to think about what we might be able to do and what we might not be able to do with terahertz and how what kinds of research problems we need to do to make it more usable. All right, so let's start then with what is terahertz. 
All right, I think to understand what exactly terahertz is, it's best to see it in a cellular context. Of course, terahertz frequencies can be used outside the cellular context as well, but this, I think, will put it in a good context. All right, so what was the big, one of the big transitions uh, recently in cellular systems was, of course, the introduction of 5G evolution from 4G. And what one feature of 5G systems was the introduction of a large number of bands in what you could call loosely the millimeter wave frequencies. So these would be bands in the United States at least, around 24 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and so on, as well as unlicensed spectrum in the 60 gigahertz range and um, the E-band systems in 73 gigahertz. Roughly things from about uh, above 6 gigahertz to maybe up to about 100 uh, gigahertz. Now, obvious reason for doing this was to get more spectrum, which would now allow much higher data rates. And we're thinking about things that are maybe up to the order of about 10 gigabits per second. I'll actually show you some slides later on about what the actual measurements that we're getting in actual 5G systems. Now, when we're talking about for the purpose of this talk, we're actually going to be looking at two classes of bands. One would you call the sub-terahertz bands, which are really just the upper millimeter wave bands, which are from 100 to 300 gigahertz, as well as communication above that, say from 300 to 3 gigahertz of bandwidth. These are right now, at least for commercial communication systems, relatively unexplored. But the obvious reason that one might want to do this is to get even more bandwidth, and to get uh, higher data rates that are not even possible in the millimeter wave bands. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, you'll see a lot of, I would call them speculative articles, including this one that I contributed on, about what will 6G do. And one of the themes about them, in addition to the fact that they're all quite speculative, is that you'll see a common um, set of things that what people are hoping for next generation wireless systems. One is there's really much more in-depth immersive experience, you can loosely call that experience sharing, as well as this is a new, more, much more richer ways that humans will interact, and I'll talk about some of these applications later on, but also much more integration of machine-to-machine -machine communication, in particular real-time control, particularly for things like robotics and drones. The other part is a much greater pervasive connectivity. So these are three high-level themes that you could say of the way that people want wireless systems to evolve. Terahertz communication is really trying to address one slice of this, which is that in certain of these applications, we need to have potentially very high data rates. And I'll try to make this more clear later, and you'll see some of these applications listed here. Now, there are other, of course, aspects of this which terahertz is not very applicable to, either very robust communication or very... Um, uh, low energy communication for embedded devices and so on, but it might hopefully attract some part of this in these parts that need very high data rates, and we'll revisit at the end some of these use cases. Now let's talk about what kind of spectrum is available for the terahertz right now. So this uh, chart comes up with this excellent presentation from Ericsson. This was actually on a backhaul um, uh, links. And so what it shows here in the green bands here are commercial bands that are used for backhaul point-to-point -point links right now. And you'll see that there's a large number of commercial applications all the way up to about 100 uh, gigahertz. But what we're going to see uh, even right now in the uh, near future are plans to commercialize bands both in what you call the W band around this 100 gigahertz as well as the D band around 140 gigahertz. So both of these are in what you could say is the upper millimeter wave band of but sometimes loosely called the sub terahertz bands. And, but one could imagine, at least for future research, going even higher, and we'll talk about both parts of this in this tutorial. But I just wanted to put this slide up to show you that there is very real commercial progress to trying to open up the bands for the purpose of terahertz communication. All right, now that we've defined what is terahertz, we can move on to the next topic, which is in channel models and propagation.